Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out um, today, this afternoon. Um, my name is Justin Kurtz. I'm chair of music production technology department here at Hart. And uh, on behalf of myself and Dr. Bob Selmer, who's the program director of the Acoustical Engineering and Music Program, I'd like to welcome you to this Hart 100 celebration event, an alumni panel discussion entitled Building a Career in Music Production and Acoustical Engineering. Uh, and thanks for all of you tuning in on the live stream. Um, thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Um, so one of the things I think is great about the Hart School, as we you know, look back uh, celebrating this 100 years, um, is the, the, really, the wide variety of programs that, that are offered here. And um, today I'm, I'm so honored and, and proud to get a chance to highlight four distinguished Hart alumni who are graduates of two of our um, perhaps somewhat less well, pro less well known programs, at least to the general public um, and maybe the wider university community. Um, that's music production and technology and acoustical engineering and music. Um, these programs train students to work primarily behind the scenes in the performing arts world as opposed to on the stage. Um, but both programs have a core of musical training, which, which is part one of, of what I think really makes them unique. Um, so I wanted to quickly thank um, former Hart Dean Larry Allen Smith and current Hart Dean Dale Merrill for supporting uh, the series of Hart 100 events this year. And also thanks to Professor uh, Glenn Adsit and Ken Steen for overseeing and organizing the programming for this celebration. Um, so first, I'd just love to uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, maybe I'll just... I'll start with uh, Jennifer Nolson, second to my right. Um, Jennifer Nolson is best known for her work as a Grammy-nominated audio engineer, having worked across North America with such artists as the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Boston Pops Orchestra, Renee Fleming, Dallas Symphony Orchestra, Philadelphia Orchestra, Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, Soap Percussion, Yo-Yo Ma, Dover Quartet, Hilary Hahn, and Consperare, among others. She has produced concert recordings for the Tanglewood Music Center Orchestra, the McGill Symphony Orchestra, and the Yale School of Music. An active freelance engineer, Ms. Nolson has worked as a recording and post-production engineer on many CD and digital releases, as well as editing and mixing engineer on national television broadcasts. Ms. Nolson is a Grammy nominee as mastering engineer for Best Historical Album in 2019, and a three-time finalist in the International Audio Engineering Society Student Recording Competition. She received a Bachelor of Music degree from Hart in 2016, double majoring in music production and uh, piano performance. She has also completed a master's degree at McGill University in the sound recording program for which she received several fellowships, including the AES Educational Foundation grant and the Bruce Swedeen Honorarium. She's completed one season at the Banff Center as head media engineer, sorry, uh, Banff, <laughs> four seasons at the Tanglewood Music Center and one season at the Aspen Music Festival as head media engineer. During the year, Jennifer often works at Swan Studios New York City on projects for clients such as Sony Classical and Deutsche Grammophon, and is also the recording engineer for the New Jersey Symphony and producer for the Park Avenue Chamber Orchestra. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> uh, next, I have Samantha Rawlings, right next. Samantha is a 2007 graduate of the Acoustical Engineering and Music Program. At Hart, she studied piano with Maggie Francis and played violin as a member of the Hart Orchestra. Post-graduation, she relocated to Los Angeles and joined Ben Clausen Associates. At Ben Clausen, Samantha has had the opportunity to work on a diverse range of projects, committees, and original research. Notable project work includes a revitalization of the Libby Bowl in Ojai, California, construction of the Wilshire Grand in downtown Los Angeles, and design and construction of the Fillmore in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a challenge due to its location in a shared structure with a hotel. <laughs> One of Samantha's primary professional interests is preparation of original research. Her work has addressed a very variety of subjects, including statistical distribution of traffic noise, open office design, heavyweight impacts for fitness applications, and HVAC noise. In addition, Samantha participates in professional committees, including ASTM, CHPS, and ICC. Through her work with ASTM, I had to look, out, look up what ASTM was, but A <laughs> American Society for Testing and Materials, two new impact noise standards, E3207 E30, and E3222, I'm sure you all know those, uh, <laughs> were published in 2020, 2020 and 2021, providing acoustical designers with additional tools for impact noise assessment. 
When not solving the wave equation, Samantha enjoys Los Angeles by roll rollerblading down the beach and eating authentic Mexican food. She continues to play violin regularly with her band, Green Ashes, which happens to boast three other Hartford graduates. Mm -hmm. The band celebrated its 10-year anniversary and released its most recent LP, Canary Row, in 2019. Samantha is thrilled to have been invited to participate in this milestone in Hart's history, and we're thrilled to have her. Thank you so much, Samantha, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Cassie Stipuani. Originally from Buffalo, New York, Cassie Stipuani graduated from the University of Hartford with a BSc in Acoustical Engineering as well as a Bachelor of Music in Cello Performance in 2012. After her time at the university, Cassie began her career as an acoustical consultant at a premier firm in New York City working with architects, engineers, and developers to create spaces and buildings whose programs needed the support of detailed acoustical design to flourish. Cassie now heads up the Building Acoustics Department at WSP USA in New York and is leading the charge to develop throughout the Northeast. While she has a diverse project experience in all building types, Cassie has developed expertise in higher education and hospitals. Cassie enjoys mentoring and teaching others to love sound. She is on a mission to increase the number of bold and confident women in the industry through mentorship. When not working, Cassie keeps busy performing with chamber groups and orchestras across the city. In particular, the Greenwich Village Orchestra has become a part of her New York City family and she has held the principal, co-principal chair for several years. After immersing herself in sound all day, at work or in play, if there is still some time left, she is an avid weightlifter and enjoys running and cycling. Thank you so much, Cassie, for being here. <laughs> finally, April Tucker. April Tucker graduated from the Hart School's Music Production and Technology Program in 2002. It's actually my first year here at Hart. April received a master's degree in sound recording from McGill University in 2004. April then moved to Los Angeles where she found her way into post-production sound for television and film. April has been described as a Jane of all trades performing nearly every major role in post-production sound over her career. Foley mixer, Foley, mixer editor, ADR mixer editor, dialogue editor, music editor, score mixer, sound designer, sound supervisor, and re-recording mixer. April's mixes have been heard on major television and cable networks and streaming platforms with audiences over 10, million, over 10 million viewers. Her film sound work has been seen at major festivals including Sundance, Cannes, South by Southwest, and Tribeca. April's clients have ranged from major studios and corporations to indie filmmakers and composers. April is the author of Finding Your Career in the Modern Audio Industry, which will be published by Routledge in 2022. July. July, very soon. Thank you so much, April, for coming. And being here. A, such a, a, a wide variety and great, um, great accomplished uh, set of alumni here with us today. So maybe um, we could just start off for some, some of us who may be less familiar with the fields that you work in. Um, just tell us a little bit about your current work, what you do most of the time during the day, um, and uh, maybe mention some of your more rewarding um, and, or interesting projects. Anybody could jump in, start, you want? You. Sure, I can start. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm an acoustical consultant, and that means that we're working with people to design their spaces for whatever their acoustical issue might be or the space that they'd want, and it can be anything from the finishes in this room, keeping noise and vibration out or in, depending on what the situation is. Um, uh, like it said, I... We work with a lot of architects and other engineers, building developers. They'll bring us on to the project and then we'll work with them on their drawings. We do a lot of drawing reviews and our product is typically a report or some kind of memo markup that we'll give to them that they can incorporate the fixes. Um, do you want to add to that at all? Um, I think that sums it up pretty well. We deal with the built environment um, and environmental noise, so, so typical noise sources that um, planes, trains, and automobiles, um, making sure it's, there's kind of a wide range because um, when you're talking about the built environment, you know, the every space, almost every space is going to have acoustic needs, but they're not all going to be the same, right? So if you're in a, a music performance space, you want to have 
really tuned in acoustics where you have good reverberation time and good reflections and avoiding all the unwanted reflections and it's very careful, but it's just as important in a classroom to have good speech intelligibility or in a train station to have good speech intelligibility so that you can find your train and um, if there were an emergency, evacuate. So acoustics, um, what we do is a very narrow kind of subset of acoustics. Yeah. Um, but it also just shows up everywhere in, and you experience it all the time, um, most of the time when you don't realize it because it's done right. Yeah, that's, that's the best part. If it's yeah. invisible, it's done right, then it's okay. Yeah. If you notice the acoustics, sometimes that's a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, unless you notice it because of its wonderful beauty mm -hmm. and it's working out. Uh, a project that I'm proud of that I've really enjoyed working on because it had a lot of math involved. Sometimes our stuff gets a little repetitive, but there is some nitty gritty math there, it was a building isolation project. The project was a high-end seniors home and a lot of the residents who had lived there had memory issues or just didn't have all of their senses with them anymore. And so it was very important to make sure that they felt safe and comfortable in this environment. We had a subway running right below the building. And what we had measured in the building next door showed that when they put their head down on the pillow for the night, they would hear that rumbling from the subway up to the 15th floor. Mm -hmm. And so for the design, we wanted to structurally separate the bottom of the building from the rest to make sure that they felt safe. Um, and it gets a lot of interesting moments, but it, you have essentially put giant rubber pads in between some of the structure, and then you work with a structural engineer to make sure that disconnect doesn't topple the building other considerations we had to think of, but it, I was proud of that project because it felt like it was really impacting someone's life and, and their well-being and, and how they would live for, you know, several more decades of mm -hmm. their life. Yeah. Yeah. Right, by the way, I would just say if anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand. We have a question mic here too and we'll, we'll just free form it, so. So my job is a little bit more what you would think of when you think of a music production and technology grad. Um, I'm working on producing music sort of from the recording stage all the way to the final mastering stage. I, I do quite a bit of location recording, uh, primarily acoustic recording, but I've um, also really heavily gotten into editing, especially over the course of the pandemic when we couldn't go record anything in person. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I've, yeah, I've worked as a mastering engineer quite a bit, um, a lot of the, the solitary work. Uh, but the, I, th I think the project that I'm most recently like very proud of is working with the Cleveland Orchestra on their mastering their new series of recordings with the new maestro. Uh, it's really excellent programming and a great team of people. And for me, I, uh, you know, I intended to go into music and I kind of, through a series of events, ended up in post-production. And as I was listening to you to talk about the process of putting, um, of basically getting a building or a space together, what I do is kind of similar, except we are putting together a television show or a movie or a commercial. And there's always a number of elements. There's voiceover, which is the, the person who says, in a world, or coming up tonight. <laughs> And then you have dialogue, which is the people talking. Um, Foley, which is where you're, you know, you're creating, you're creating sounds with the microphone. Um, it's literally what we do for a job. And then sound design, <laughs> sound design, which is like um, you just have a hard drive, which is a library of sound effects, and you just go in and you, you grab it and you stick it in. And it could be anything from we were, we were working on a project yesterday in Gabe's class that was, um, you know, at a train station. So you're grabbing train sounds and and wind and atmosphere. And um, so for me in LA, sometimes you are compartmentalized, like you only do one role, and that's how I've managed to become a Jane of all trades. I just, someone says, do you wanna, can you do this Foley gig? I'd say, okay. Or they'd say, do you wanna be a music editor? All right. Um, but now the, the work I primarily do is promotional and advertising related. So it is the coming up tonight on this show and coming up tomorrow on this show and coming up next and it keeps going. But I do get to do a lot of really fun sound design. Um, it's a lot of um, troubleshooting, problem solving, um, collaborative work, and I find it really creatively rewarding. And, and actually, at this point in my career, what I like about it is um, there's some things we do that I know that someone's just going to mute it 
and go, go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay, because if I'm having an off day at work, right, or I'm, you know, my son is sick or whatever, it's like, I can get this done, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not like somebody's, you know, creative, you know, that they put their, they put their house, they put gotten a second mortgage out on their house to finish their film. That happened once with a filmmaker. Like, it's not, um, there's kind of this lightness to it um, in the type of work. But in terms of rewarding projects, ironically, I would say it's some of the documentaries that I've worked on. Mm -hmm. Because I just feel like, you know, I worked on The Bachelor for five years, and as much as um, I love the people on the show, and it was a, a fantastic um, learning experience, but I always... I was always had a little conflict between, okay, people are going to be sitting at their television for two hours every Monday night. When I work on a documentary, it's I'm helping them learn about, you know, football players with CTE or um, uh, the alt-right or, you know, the, these topics that are, get a little bit um, where I feel like I might actually educate or help somebody learn more about something they wouldn't otherwise. Well, that's great. And deadlines, right? I mean, you're, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you've got that, you know, hard deadlines. You learn how, you learn how to, to work with deadlines yeah. when you're working in post, for sure. For sure. Um, so what sorts of, I mean, I'm curious of a couple of things. One is um, some of the more valuable things you feel that you learned while you were in school that, you know, maybe obvious, maybe less obvious. Um, and then maybe part of that, too, uh, how, how your music background, how your own, your own musicians and you all, mm -hmm went to music school and how you feel like that comes into play in your work, um, again, maybe in an obvious or less obvious way. Well, I mean, I can start because I had sure. one just like 10 minutes ago, which was a <laughs> uh, friend of mine who I went to heart with. Um, I remember doing a theater show with him and I, I had never done a theater show. I didn't, the, the technical stuff was kind of a little over my head and I was overwhelmed a little bit. and. And I remember coming to him and he'd be like, what's going on with this? And I would just kind of spill all the technical stuff. And I remember he, he, you know, he was like, dear, because he called everyone dear. He's like, dear, <laughs> I don't need to hear this. Like, you, just tell me what needs to happen and I will make it happen. And that was a lesson that I'm so glad that I learned as a student. There's a lot of those like just little learning how to interact with people and how to, to manage your own, um, do your own problem solving and learning to stay cool. Um, and in terms of my music background, that's, become, that's been really helpful in television because I do do some music as part of my work, understanding how music works against dialogue or how to edit something so it isn't musically wonky because a lot of times picture editors will say, here's the beginning of the cue, here's the end, I'm going to cut this out and stick it together. And that's good. <laughs> well, we've all heard those, those bad edits on commercials yep. when they're in, like skips a beat or something. Yep, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that one, right. I mean, very similar to you. I, the, the thing I tell people when they ask me about my experience at the Hart School is that it was a terrific sandbox where there are a myriad of projects that you can get involved in at Hart of all different sorts, whether it's working on post projects with Gabe's class or with art school students, or it's working with the theater department I, or the composition department. Um, and so, yeah, it was a lot of learning how to do like project management, multitasking, and taking a lot of the technical things that we were learning by day and immediately having to turn around and say, okay, I just learned about what star clock is and I really need star clock tonight when I try and make all these different pieces of equipment work together for one recording. Or, you know, I need to figure out how to apply some of the stuff I learned in my acoustics course to deal with this really horrible feedback situation mm -hmm. in a little venue downtown or something. Um, so that was probably the greatest thing I took away from this was just like technical knowledge during the day and then instant practical application yeah. in, in the evening, which is fantastic. Um, musically, yeah, I, I use the musical skills I learned every day because I'm working with a lot of composers and musicians who feel really comfortable knowing that I also am a, albeit lapsed, a lapsed musician, but I can speak the language. I've been in their seat sometimes and um, I know some of the things that they'll be concerned about and can kind of set their mind at ease, which is ideal. Yeah, I completely agree about the speaking their language bit. Because what we do when we do work on a music rehearsal or performance space is we'll meet with the users and we'll find out what do you, what do you intend to use this for. And as acoustic design professionals, we have a very similar language to speaking about sound, but it's not the same. And if, if I can jump in and talk about 
pitch or warmth or clarity instead of um, frequency and volume, or level, I guess, um, then I'm telling them not only I get you, but I'm one of you. I've been in your shoes. I know what it's like to be in a room that's not working for some reason. So the music background definitely helps for that reason. Um, I think also that as I was thinking through this question, I couldn't think of a class that I took that didn't have some use, you know, from understanding how buildings move, from, you know, our statics and dynamics classes and, and all the materials classes. Um, there's, some, there's some piece of it that has come in at some point when I'm trying to solve a problem. So I really appreciated that. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was just kind of the story that I've been mulling over, which is not directly related to the actual technical content of anything I do, but um, at the very beginning of my senior year, I was here at Hart, and I was in a practice room just kept killing time between classes. And as I'm playing through something, there's a knock on my door, and I'm expecting that I'm going to open the door and someone's going to say, I have this room reserved, can you please leave? And instead, in walks a gentleman who's a couple years older than me, talking a mile a minute. He comes in, he sits down at my piano, and he starts playing it, and the piece I was playing better than me, and then explaining to me if it's too hard for me where I can take cuts. And I don't even know if I said anything to this person. I was just standing there like, do I know you? Like, where's this coming from? And I remember thinking, it was so odd that he would advise me to take cuts if my piano teacher didn't think I needed to. Like, you know, surely she would know better. So it was so odd to me, I mentioned it to my piano teacher at my next lesson, and she goes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I know who that is. Um, he's a grad student. He just came from another school. And uh, what he was doing is he was trying to one-up you by playing your music better by helping. And I, as soon as she said it, I was like, oh, of course. And I remembered that's how it was in high school, right? Like, like that's the kind of stuff we did. I did that to other people in that environment. It was that very <laughs> kind of like competitive thing. But I had just, I hadn't recognized it here. And she said, yeah, that's, um, that's not how we are at heart. It's not how we want to be. So I'm going to speak to his teacher. And at the moment, like back then, my reflection on it was really like how, how different this environment is that um, both in Hart and in CETA, instead of being competitive, it's collaborative. And it's supportive, not only faculty, staff to student, but student to student, where we're all looking out for each other. And at that time, I was just really glad to be in an environment that was like that and that I had spent um, three years there. The other thing is that it, it kind of blew me away that after three me measly years in a very good environment, I didn't even recognize one-upmanship when it literally knocked on the door. <laughs> um, and now, 15 years later, I think back on that and what strikes me is just the incredible power that a positive culture has to really create a great environment. And so that's something that I think about for all the different organizations that I'm in, um, especially the ones where I have some leadership position, is, is what kind of culture am I looking to foster in that particular environment? So. I can definitely continue on that supportive environment piece. Um, the, I thought of two, and one of them was just, for me personally, when I came here, I had terrible performance anxiety, and I'm sure Dr. Bob remembers me presenting in the engineering school, and my knees were doing this, <laughs> and I couldn't hold my hands straight. I just, it was a horrible experience for me, but in a learning, growing way, and the amount of supportive environments that you get both at Hart and in the engineering school presenting, you have your juries, mm -hmm. master classes, studio classes, all of that practice really was exactly what I needed, and it was a supportive environment, so I didn't get as nervous anymore. And that actually encouraged me to add the performance degree in my second year, because I was like, maybe I can do this. In this environment, I can, I can pull this off. So there's that piece that I really appreciate, because we're in meetings or <laughs> presentations all the time with clients, and now I, I don't even have a second thought about it. And then the critical ear. Uh, when we test on site, we have to listen to what's going on in so many different ways. And to train our ears here first really was a blessing and also a bit of a curse. I mean, we all sat at dinner the other night and everybody looked up at the HVAC and the air conditioning unit when it made noise and we were all acousticians. Um, but that critical listening was a very important piece to success in our, in our careers.
It's such an important point about the dynamic, and that's something I never really considered. I mean, I don't remember ever feeling, like I remember being in classes where I, I, there was 30 people and I was the only woman there, and I never felt any sort of, you know, that I was lesser than anybody. And, and I know, Justin, you were always really, you know, you just, everyone is treated equally. Everyone's here for the same reason, like, it, which is, looking back, especially 20-some years ago, that that's amazing that, that the school really had that culture and mm -hmm. still does, it sounds like. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I always, uh, my year, so we had uh, women, one woman in each class on either side of me and then me in the middle, and all three of us still talk weekly. <laughs> we all work in similar fields. We send work back and forth. And I really appreciated that both you, Justin, and Gabe never made us feel like we were fighting each other for the same yeah. one lady spot, that yeah. there was room for all of us to work in very similar fields, and, and we do. And there were actually <laughs> four in my class, four out of, it like, was like half of our class, that was really unusual nice. at the time. Oh, that's really, that's, that's great to hear, it's so nice. So, so obviously, you, know, you follow your passions, you, you're working in areas that you love, there are probably some things that, you know, reasons for that. Um, maybe, what are, some of, what are some of the challenges you find, uh, maybe on the other side of that, uh, of, of working in a field, in your fields, in your current work, would you say? Any particular thing? I mean, not, not to just <laughs> rant here or anything, but, but uh, you know, just sort of to, to get the reality out there to the folks listening and, the, and uh, about what, you know, how, and maybe how, how do you handle it when, when things aren't going, maybe aren't your, your greatest, um, most fun projects or, or people that maybe are not your best friends? Um, have you managed to, to, to work with that? I think the biggest challenge in my profession is communication. Specifically communicating a technical something to somebody who's not trained the way I am. Because I can go and sit at my desk and do an analysis and I can be like, well, if we add another layer of drywall, you know, we'll get 3 dB. And if we add, you know, another wall, we're going to get another 8 dB. And they'll look at me and go, okay, <laughs> do I want 8? So then I have to try to put this in some context of, well, what that means is, you know, when the bus drives by, 30% of a norm population with normal hearing is going to wake up, but if you know if you get the extra wall in there, then then maybe f you know 25% will wake up, and and you'll get complaints if you know if the building's occupied in this in such a way. But some context for um, you know if if you do this, then it'll sound like this, and if you don't do it, it'll sound like this. That's like that makes sense to somebody who's not a musician, who's probably not trained in critical listening and is trying to decide if they're going to spend $100,000 on what you're recommending because you've said it's a good idea. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge. I don't know if you yeah. have similar. It is a huge one. It's, I think another one for us is that there's still unknowns. Not oh, everything yes. in acoustics is known or researched or yeah. developed. And so new problems are popping up all the time and you might be recommending something you haven't implemented before and you have all the science and math to back it up, but that's a scary moment when it's being built and you're like, come on, yeah. this is gonna work. Yeah. Um, the, the super tall buildings that are going up um, all over the world, but in New York, they're very thin, they move a lot. But we've seen a lot of our creaking walls. Oh, sure. it's, it's going to move, it's supposed to, that's natural. They weight it so it doesn't make you uncomfortable as the occupant, but we have found a lot of acoustical issues with creaking walls. and. That's not something that we've seen too often, and it's been a bear to get over. Yeah, I, I agree completely. The unknowns, like the unknowns. Um, our field is 110 years old, which is relatively young, particularly cons 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 compared to other engineering disciplines. And there's a lot that's just not known, and mm -hmm. and things evolve. Like modular construction oh, is becoming sure. <laughs> much more common. People using like shipping containers. What's the transmission loss of a shipping container? <laughs> I don't know, what's the impact isolation? I don't know, grab two containers and stick them on top of each other and let's measure it, you know? Um, so there's a lot of consulting that we have to do where we just don't have information and uh, you, you still gotta get it right. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, the challenges for me are twofold and one is creating a relationship with a client that where they feel immediate trust and uh, re there's mutual respect, but without them feeling like you need to be their best friend, 
mm. or that you're on the other side trying to squeeze as much money as you can out mm. of them. <laughs> um, and I've had clients on both sides of that where some of them, you know, want to text you at 11 o'clock at night and say, okay, but did you really like my solo? Do you think it's perfect? Is version nine great? Or how about 11? I don't know. I'm going back and forth. And I'm like, I don't text anyone at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> so it's that side, but also the other side of saying, you know, um, I want you to feel that I'm not, I'm not dragging you along for a ride. I'm not trying to squeeze three more hours of edit time out of you. If I say something's good, I mean it, and I believe that it's good. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a huge challenge. And then the other challenge, of course, working in acoustic music and particularly classical music is that um, you want to do things perfectly and beautifully and the standard that's been held up is a standard that was set by large, well-funded labels. And figuring mm -hmm. out in a new paradigm where people aren't making a lot of money off of CD sales anymore, but you still want to have an incredible production standard with maybe less than ideal acoustic situations or equipment considerations, is a, it's a really big consideration and it's different for every project. I think what you're saying about trust absolutely applies in post. I know one of the biggest challenges for me is that um, I some, uh, very often don't have control over the content that I receive. And um, like, you know, uh, I think I used these examples yesterday of working on The Bachelor and if someone decides to declare their love in a hot tub or in front of an <laughs> airplane or on a date with a bunch of flamingos that look amazing but they're going honk, honk, honk in the background. <laughs> You know, I can only do so much there <laughs> in the time I'm given, right? Um, so th that's that's it. The, my name is is on things that um, where my colleagues may listen to it and go, "Oh, that's not like it, they wouldn't necessarily say it's not good, but they they would say that's rough audio." Um, <laughs> but the thing is, someone who's really in the know would be like, "Wow, I can't believe they got it to that point compared to how bad it was." before. But then also, you know, you, your name gets put on, on product projects that, that maybe aren't your, you know. There's only been a couple times I've turned things down because I was like, I, this, the content, I do not want to be associated with this. Um, and that is something I've really had to think about is like, where's the line for what I will or more, won't work on. Uh, I did a medical show once early in my career and I just, I, I got so queasy, like I couldn't even watch the screen and you're, you're responsible for watching the screen to make sure that everything's in sync. So that was kind of, for me it was like, yeah, I don't think I can do horror, I can't do medical shows. Um, and then there's just some, just in terms of my own priorities that I wouldn't feel appropriate, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't feel good having my, my name on that. No, that's, I mean, that's great and to hear how, you know, we all know that not every, it's not always roses every day and, and how you have, you know, challenges that you have to face and uh, figuring out how to gracefully do that. Um, so we have a bunch of uh, current students here and hopefully maybe some on, online watching. Um, do you have, I mean, I know this is a very open-ended, broad question, but um, just general advice for, for folks studying now who are interested in these fields or maybe not entirely certain exactly what direction they want to go, um, but just any, any sort of bits of wisdom you could offer. Well, I know I would, I would suggest um, if you're motivated, team up with other people that are motivated because you, you are going to encourage each other to learn and to learn new things. Um, and I think, I mean, just to be perfectly honest, every year there's, you know, there, there are going to be students who lose interest or who aren't engaged or who are just in it for the grade or who maybe drop out of the program. And, then, and I'm not saying don't participate with them, but like if you see people that are, that are really gravitating to the same things as you, just go for it, right? And you, you can go and do things outside of class. I mean, I think for me, when I was a student, the thing I got the most value from was being work study, working in the office, even if it was doing cassette dubs, um, if it was working with, with Nina Fagan, who was the studio manager at the time, when students would come in and they'd ask, you know, I need to book something. I'm learning how to communicate with someone I don't know. Um, so I think that, that, like you were saying earlier, there's so much value in taking what you're learning in the classroom and applying that outside of the class, whether it's a project you find by yourself or, um, or just going home and playing around with a, with a project, just to kind of expand your horizon beyond what's, what's taught in class and assigned in class. That's a lesson I didn't learn until I got to grad school, sadly. <laughs> I was surrounded by great people here, but we didn't really work collaboratively, collaboratively until I got uh, out of undergrad and I realized I had missed out on a whole opportunity there. Uh, but I, I would say probably the greatest advice I could give 
to current students is that it's, um, there's no such thing as something being impossible to try. There are a lot of things that may look really daunting. I know when I started there, the question of multi-tracking orchestra with only one person was like, you don't do it, it's crazy, there's no setup time. And I like, I sort of weaseled my way in and was like, okay, what, what if I just put out a, a bass mic? Is that okay? I'll put out a bass mic and two mics, all right. Then I'm gonna add a, a flute mic. And you know, by the end of it, I had you know, 16 channels going. But it is, I think it's important to try everything um, because the more things you try while you're here, while you have the safety net of the school, yes. um, the more you learn before you get out and somebody's paying you to do something and you're not sure if you can accomplish it. Yeah, um, kind of along those lines, as you were speaking, I was thinking about uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, we were at dinner last night with Dr. Bob and Dr. Jasinski, and they were sharing about the story about how the sophomore design class came to be. It was actually the class right after mine, um, and it's because they just asked that we all had a sophomore design class, and they asked Dr. Bob if they could do an acoustics project instead of whatever they had been assigned, and um, Dr. Bob said yes, and history was made. And, and so you kind of never know what might be possible if you, if you don't just ask. Um, my other kind of piece of advice is that I think a lot of attention gets to the architectural consulting side um, because there's, it's, it's a pretty natural place to go. There's a lot of graduates who go there. But we represent a very tiny section of what you can do with acoustics and vibration education. And it can be overwhelming when you're getting to the place of like, you know, what am I going to do when I graduate? I mean, you could you can do speaker design, you can do musical instruments, you can do, you can go into healthcare and do hearing aids and ultrasound and and audiology. You can do transportation, anything that moves makes noise. Um, transportation, you could do aerospace. So we're literally in a field where the sky is not the limit, and that can be very daunting. Um, so while you're a student, do as much as you can to evaluate the different fields, get as much like exposure to the things so that you know before you graduate or have some idea, you know, do I want more school? Do I want to go out in the working, you know, which direction might I want to go with my life? Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. We talked about internships, we talked about shadowing, but even more informal things, um, going to conferences, participating in the clubs where they do the field trips to different industry. Um, so yeah, I would just encourage you to, to explore. It's a lot easier to change direction the younger you are, the easier it is, and the, the older you are, the harder it gets. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is you can also talk to people in the field, mm -hmm. like shadowing. You had mentioned yeah. shadowing, and you can call someone up and say, I'd love to just get coffee with you sometime. Can we just talk about what you do on a daily basis and see if I might like that too? And almost no professional is going to just turn mm -hmm. you down <laughs> if you call for that. They like, We all like mentoring, I think, mm -hmm. in some extent. and. It could be a great way to get an insight on them, their company, what they do, mm -hmm. and then call the next person on the other spectrum. Go to Bo's and see what they're up to. And that applies to MPT as well. I think um, the the alumni network is is um, it's a gold mine of, <laughs> of people and information. And I think pretty much you email and even even if it's jumping on a Zoom call with someone who lives not near here, you know, or overseas or whatever. Um, I think asking questions, just being like, hey, I want to talk to you. I want to learn about your job. You're not saying, hey, I'm looking, to f how do I find work? How do I, you know, it's not about you. It's about, can you please share with me what you know? Yeah, I, I love emailing with current or recent students. Um, I am not the most personable person in the world, but I love emailing with people because it's always so interesting to see where they're coming from and what they're thinking about and where they're going. And, and I, I really like working with people from this background. We were talking about that a bit, but when you were visiting with our students about networking, the idea mm -hmm. of being, you know, when you're here, this is this is your first, you know, network, mm -hmm. um, and uh, make use of it, I guess. Is the, is yeah, start laying your groundwork now, because because yeah. it, it's just gonna, you know, it 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 literally grows like this, and you have this group of people who are then helping you, and this group of people who are helping them who are helping you, and it's that's really where the where the work comes from is the more people who know that you exist more people that could potentially think of you and, and recommend you for something. For sure, and this, I mean, and, and hard to, I mean, a great example of where we have all these, this wide range of programs and specialties kind of, but related to the performing arts in general. So it's, it's yeah, it, it is a gold mine of, of a network to start with. So 
Um, so to go off script a little bit, um, is there something you, you wish you had learned in school that you, mm -hmm. whether it was here or elsewhere, um, course-wise or otherwise, think of? <laughs> Sorry, this is on the spot here. <laughs> I'm really jealous of that sophomore design class. <laughs> I think um, I mentioned this yesterday, but I wish I had taken conducting classes when I was here. Oh. That would have been really helpful for me. Yeah, I think I wish, would have taken arranging if I, business, for sure, business classes, oh. um, like formal business, just because so many people end up being freelance and working for themselves. And I guess when I was here, there was no, uh, you didn't do a, a music production class until your junior year. <laughs> so so I'm, that's, that's uh, not, not the case anymore. But something that influences our sector of acoustics is noise from air conditioning systems, and at the time there wasn't a class to look at that and analyze that, but it's since been added, because the alumni all gave that feedback, and mm -hmm. they were great to take that, and that was one that would have, I think, helped a bit, kind of push mm -hmm. forward. But. And I mentioned this yesterday, I regret not going to New York and Boston just for events, uh, especially industry mm -hmm. events, because there's, you know, there's AES talks happening everywhere. And that, again, that's a chance to just go. You go up to the person afterwards and, hey, it was nice to meet you. I really enjoyed talking about this. Or you email them a week later. And that's, again, it's just laying that groundwork for something to happen in the future. And there is no loss with those. If you go and it's a horribly boring talk, they always have free food. And you, <laughs> yeah. will, meet, you will meet other people that maybe also thought it was boring but are also interested in something that you're interested in. Like it's like what your parents tell you. I mean, there's no, there's no bad experiences. You're, you're always learning from something or other. Yes. So is there some uh, future, future goal that you have in mind, something that you'd like to do in the future that you haven't done yet, or ideas about that? Any ideas? I mean, I know when I first started out, I, I mean, probably like everybody, it's like you get out of music production, you're like, I want to go produce music. I want to move to New York or L.A. I'm going to win a Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> And for me, you know, and then I shifted into post, and my 25-year-old self says, I'm going to win a, 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 an Emmy. And then over time kind of just found that it, it's, there's a certain amount of politics to it, just like, you know, whoever gets class president in high school or, or the, the prom king and queen. So I learned early in my career that I just don't really, I don't really have goals. I just go after what I find interesting. And that has never set me wrong. Yeah, I, I did the same thing where I was like, oh, I want to win a Grammy by the time I'm 30. And uh, I, don't, I don't care if I win a Grammy uh, now. But um, <laughs> I, I, I found that really for me, I think I'll be very happy at the end of my life if I worked on interesting projects with really nice people. Yeah. I don't really care what it is. It could be any really you know, spoken word. It could be new age. I worked on a new age saxophone record, which I have never thought was a sentence I would say. <laughs> um, but it, if it's with lovely people and they're people that you can enjoy having a meal with afterwards or that you stay in touch with, that's incredibly fulfilling. Yeah. And especially, it's even better if you believe in the, in the project itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice people are way better than great projects. I've worked on some great projects with some really terrible people. <laughs> Your Grammys are not going to call you and congratulate you if you're like, you know, you do something nice or you get married or yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if I really have an answer to this one, but I would definitely <laughs> echo, echo what you say about, um, I guess it kind of comes down to like what, what's important to you in life and... Um, I guess figuring that out, and I definitely have really enjoyed the people that I've been working with, um, and I've discovered that that's something that I really value, is that that collaboration and kind of companionship there. Yeah, it's, it's all about the people. Mm. And when you can get the good people, that's, that really makes it fulfilling. And even when it's the client that's the mm -hmm. great person, then you're, you know, you're helping them, they're satisfied, they're happy, and it's, it just makes it more fulfilling. It keeps you motivated to do the work, too. Because, yes. I mean, I think when you're a student, you're just thinking about, oh, cool, audio. Or, oh, cool, acoustics, right? Yeah. But, but when there's someone there who's giving you feedback and telling you, you know what, I don't really like this. Let's do it again. Could you do this differently? What's, you know, problem, 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 problem. If it's someone that you don't like and they're just bringing you all of their issues with what you're doing, it, it, it can be really um, 
it's a lot of um, criticism. I mean, it's it's professional criticism. So mm -hmm. so it's no it's not about you personally. It's about or that your ability to do the job. It's just they want things the way that they want it, and you have to find a way to get them there. And that's way easier if it's people that you like, who you know <laughs> might take you out for lunch from time to time, mm -hmm. who call you to say happy birthday or yeah, whatever. Exactly. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It is it is horrible to get criticism from people when you don't like them because you just say you know, oh they don't like me, they don't like my work. That's how it is. You know, it's yeah. a personal thing. Where they're never happy. Like I worked with a on a show once where the producer was just like didn't was unhappy with everything every single week. Just in there, do it. Do, uh, this isn't right. This isn't. This is right. And I had never had a client like that before. And then towards the end of the show, he disappeared. And the post production supervisor said, Yeah, he was just miserable here. He was kind of taking it out on you. It was nothing you did. But it was like I dreaded going to work those days because I'm like, I'm just going to have to sit there and listen to this guy complain about music edits for, <laughs> for six hours or whatever. Yeah. But you learn from that. That's how you learn to say no the next time you, you, you feel that you're working with someone you're like, this is just not. Or for me, it always turns into a thing inside my brain where um, I'm like, how do I make them like me? Oh, I'm going to yeah. make them love me, and then I'm going to say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think another kind of reality of our jobs, probably every job, is that um, people are much more likely to go out of their way to say what they don't like than what they do like. Mm -hmm. And so when people say to you something like, wow, what you did really helped me, you saved me money, I can sleep at night now, or um, I, I just really appreciated that I felt like you heard me and really listened to me, that those are like those are probably worth like ten or twenty comments that didn't get said, um, and and should, I, I, don't know, I really cherish those moments and say yeah my Absolutely. my work means something here. Yeah. For sure. Well, we have about fifteen minutes. Are there any questions that have come up that anybody wants to ask at this point? <laughs> Kobe, go ahead. We have a question mic for the screen. For the screen. So we have, we have a few students here who are getting ready to graduate soon uh, and kind of thinking about what their first steps outside of school might look like. And I think a lot of the time when we hear about people's careers, we see them or hear about them as like a linear path. Like, mm -hmm. I started here, that's what I'm doing now forever, and yep. that's going to be my whole career. So I'm wondering, April, you mentioned a little bit about a pivot moment for you. So I'm wondering if we can just expand on that a little bit and talk about any moments in your career where you've made a hard turn somewhere else than where you originally thought you were going to be. Yeah, I mean, I can just tell you my first, so I moved to, to LA. Uh, I worked for a recording truck. I did a couple gigs for them. They got in a huge fight when I was there, blamed me for it, never hired me again. I thought I'd never have a career. Um, I worked, I was um, making microphones. I was inventorying uh, equipment at a at a rental facility that was going under, out of business. I, I'm trying to think. Even the first couple of years, um, I did cataloging of a music library. Um, I was doing classical music recording and editing. I was uh, doing that at schools. And for, I mean, like if you looked at my 1099s, I probably had like 20 clients that year. Um, <laughs> but because it was, and this is something I talk about in my book. The the first couple years at a school are about survival. It's about doing whatever gig you can take, whether it's working at Starbucks because it'll give you insurance, or if it's you know, finding 10 different people who are going to hire you once a month, but that gives you enough money to pay your rent or to save money so that then you can move to New York and have six months of savings so that you can go just meet people and, and you're paying yourself. So, I mean, for me, part of that pivot was, you know, I was offered a job in music, I was offered a job in post the same week. And someone, um, I remember people, the people that I'd been networking with and meeting up to that point, all the people in music were saying, go take the post job. Like, they just, they were so adamant about, like, this is going to give you the stability that if you want to come back into music in a couple of years, you can. And that was really the reason I took that job. It was, you know, I need a stable job. I need, um, and I'd like to save some money, and then we'll just go from there. I'll figure it out in a year or two. And then I just turned out I liked it, and I just kept going that way. So yeah, definitely not like, you know, I, was, I thought I was going to be a music <laughs> producer, you know, working at... Capitol Records or the record plant or something. And, but my friends who went that route, they were cleaning toilets with a toothbrush and then eventually <laughs> working as an assistant and then got into post. <laughs> I never really had a big pivot moment. Um, 
I've kind of always been, I don't want to say pigeonholed because I do very much enjoy it, but I've always been sort of pulled back into classical music, acoustic music. But I will also say that if the money is right, I never say no to a gig. And if I have the time and maybe the money's not great, but it's something I haven't done before, I'll always say yes because I'm always curious to figure out if there's maybe something else out there that I don't know that I love yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I've done a crazy number. I've, I've done like weird art museum installation, live sound. I've amplified that John Cage cactus piece, I think four or five times <laughs> at this point. I've, uh, I've, I'm working on radio broadcasts and podcasts now on the side. Um, I've recorded metal, I've recorded pop, I've, like, I've done ADR, I've done voiceover. And it's just, it's always looking for stuff to keep things interesting, to keep things exciting. Yeah. Um, so ostensibly, if you look at my career path, it is linear, um, but it's not. Because in the time I've, I graduated, I went to my company and I've been there ever since. But in that time, I've worked for at least four different managers. And, um, and my job has shifted. I started as entry level measure, uh, analyze, report. And as the years have gone on, I have moved to training and project management and all of these different things. So even a, I know this doesn't answer your question, but even a linear appearing career isn't really a linear appearing career. And you might, anybody might find that as they march through that path that they get, hold, uh, hold up a second. I, I now in management and I really liked the analysis. So what am I doing over here? And maybe it's time to shift back a little bit. That's good. I had a similar, you know, engineer analysis and then into the project management, people management. But I had a pivotal moment last year, which when you're leaving school, you're looking at different companies, different gigs. Mm -hmm. What makes that work for you? What do you want out of it? And does it match? So one of the company I worked at for nine years, I'm so fortunate to have learned there. I learned so much. It was an amazing experience. And then I was coming to a point where it just didn't seem like we were jiving, which wasn't any fault of either side, just that timeline had run out. And I got a call from another company, the company I'm at now, WSP, and it was giving me a little more freedom to create a culture rather than sit into a company culture that was already there. And for me, that was a big pivotal moment because it was like, let me take the stuff that I've learned and now try to create a department that has the vibe that I'm looking for and then see if I can get some good collaboration with that, and that's been a lot of fun. No, oh, that's great. Thanks. We have, uh, any, other, any other questions at this point from anyone? Um, something just occurred to me, too, about this, this idea of, you know, the path maybe being linear, but not really being linear, you know, or being kind of a zigzag. And, you know, at certain times, there may have been moments when you had to kind of uh, negotiate with yourself and ask yourself, um, maybe I didn't go to school. This isn't how I, what I envisioned myself doing exactly, but maybe I don't have much of a choice or like just that internal struggle that you have. And, and maybe if, if there were moments or there are there moments that you can reflect on about that and, and maybe how they turned out or how have you handled those, those situations. Maybe it's taking a gig you didn't really either think you wanted to do or you just had to do it or I don't know, you were afraid of getting stuck in some, somewhere you didn't want to be or something like that? I mean, Maybe it's a natural a fear. And I know just from interviewing a ton of people for my book that so many people go into music production programs, not just heart, but like everywhere. Um, they think they're going to get into music and then they get out and they realize that either where they live, where they, where they think it's important for them to live just in terms of their personal priorities doesn't align with the type of work that they're trying to get. And actually that's not just music. That could apply for film mm -hmm. too. So, I mean, that's... For me, that was actually a big part of, of one of the messages I want to get across in my book and why I wanted to write it is just this idea that like, if you're working for Universal Audio or if you're working in post, you're working in podcasting or you decide to go be a manager at Best Buy, like there's nothing wrong with any of those. You've still gained these skills of learning how to troubleshoot, of learning how to work with people, technical skills. Like, There's so many people who end up in, um, I don't know about heart graduates, but I know in a lot of, of schools, it's like they end up in computers and IT and programming and um, AV. AV is another area that like the, the skills we learn here go naturally into that, but there's almost this like stigma 
of I went to school for this, so I can't do that. But there, I think there's um, no one's a failure. There, there's it's just wherever your path takes you. Getting stuck. I mean, it's a real fear mm -hmm. of, of getting. I have a, I have the same fear of like I worry that I'm gonna like wake up in ten years and be like, oh God, what have I been doing? Which is part of why I take all these like funny little, funny little gigs. Um, but I, you know, I think it's a, a balance with yourself to say, am I doing something because it's easy or comfortable, or am I actually doing something where I feel good at the end of the day? And maybe not every day. You know, there are definitely days that I don't feel great. But as long as you can, maybe once a month check in and say, does this still, does it still spark joy? Yeah. Does it still make me feel <laughs> like I'm doing something that um, challenges me, even in uh, little ways? I and, I, and I do have to add that, so for me, when I became a parent, there was a period of time where it was like, my audio work is less important than me being present as a parent. And I planned that up front. I always knew I wanted to be a parent and then probably slip to part-time or just into work that would be less demanding because it was more important for me to be at my kid's birthday party than it was for me to have an Emmy. Um, and so I think that, that it changes, too. And I think as you get older, you're, you know, if you might have family members that get ill or you know, COVID happens, and, and these things happen that make you maybe have to pivot for a while, but it doesn't necessarily have to be forever. It's, you know, it's not like you pick one thing and you're, you're stuck there the rest of your life. Yeah, I think that's been a challenge for me is the imagination of what my life could look like versus what I think it will look like, and recognizing that I actually have no idea what's going to happen in five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever down the line. I... I almost switched paths <laughs> and realized that where I was was where I wanted to be, and that was part of the company switch, too, is just the environment helped me realize that, I, no, I'm, I'm still good at acoustics, but I had gotten into culinary school, and I almost went. Uh, but <laughs> it was going to be an after-work thing, check that out, see if that kind of fit more where I had ended up after 10 years of being out of school, but it helped me see, no, this is, I find this more fun. <laughs> All right, well, any other questions that we have? No? Well, thank you so much. I think, I think we can wrap it up, but I'm so, so proud and so glad to have all of you back with us. It's just been a real pleasure to visit with our students and share your experience and, and see just, you know, it kind of for us too as, as faculty members, it's, it's a nice, well, you know, I guess we think about it sometimes, but, you know, when we see folks that have gone through the program and, and go out and be successful, it's, that's, that's the most rewarding part of what we do, for sure. So, um, it's, yeah, thank you, and, you know, thank you so much to, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Selmer for, for partnering with, the, with me on this, um, bringing back um, wonderful uh, alumni that we have today. So, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Comment. There was one thing I remember from Dr. Bob's class. This would have been 22 years ago. And he, you said, he said, why is it that coffee smells so good and tastes so bad? But cheese <laughs> tastes so bad, but smells so good. I don't know why that is always <laughs> Oh, is it talking wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I remember a lot of the acoustics too, but yeah. <laughs> I liked when you shook the water, we all got out. thirsty. Yeah, yeah. 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 She shook her water in the microphone and everyone was like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess so.